I'm Steve Goldman. I'm the director of the Center for Free Enterprise, and I want to thank you for coming to our first event of the Menard Family Lecture Series. We have two more events coming up this semester on October 8th. Bob Lawson and Ben Powell will be here to discuss their book, Socialism Sucks, Two Economists Drink Their Way Through the Unfree World. They, they've been in a couple years, they came in a couple years ago, and it's pretty riveting um, discussion. You guys should really show up. And then on November 20th, we're going to have a healthcare panel with health healthcare executives in the Louisville area who are also College of Business alums. So it's a great opportunity for you to hear what's going on in the healthcare industry and also consider possibility of getting a job with these people. You can come up and talk to them afterwards. So it's a great opportunity. I want to thank the Louisville Cinema Society for coming today. I think there's a group of them here, so thank you guys. And um, Hopefully, as you go through your programs here at UofL, you'll realize that you can make people's lives better through business, so you should major in business because you add value to people's lives, so make sure you do that. All right, if you're here for class credit or reading group participation or Cardinal Flight Program, we will have a QR code in the back of the room after the event. You'll need to scan that and fill out the survey and, and also make sure you say what class you're here for, what what situation you're here for so we can give you credit for being here. But also at the end of the movie, up here on the screen we will have a, a QR code and that will be for the Mercatus Center. And by the way, I want to thank the Mercatus Center for jointly sponsoring this with us. I didn't read my notes. But um, I want to thank them for being here, bringing um, Ben in and, and also um, helping sponsor this. But they, they'll want to know what um, what you thought of the movie and, and some tweaks to the movie, I think. So please um, please fill out both surveys. Um, today we're fortunate to have with us as our speaker um, one of the members of the crew of the film Undivide Us. Ben Clutzi is the executive director of the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And before stepping into that role, he led the Mercatus Center's program on pluralism in civil exchange, an initiative dedicated to fostering a deeper understanding and appreciation of pluralism, which is a fundamental, a fundamental pillar of free, flourishing, and prosperous society. In that role, he ran a pluralist lab, a series of structured sessions that bring students from different backgrounds and perspectives together to practice, to practice conversations across those differences. So not to yell at each other and say you're stupid, but to actually talk to each other and get some good ideas from each other. And so Ben's passionate about driving meaningful dialogue and advancing ideas and practices that sustain a free and open society. He has an MA in International Commerce and Policy from George Mason University and a BA in Government and Philosophy from Lawrence University. He's going to briefly introduce the film then we're going to watch the film, and then Ben will take questions afterwards. So thank you, and enjoy the movie. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all for coming. Uh, as Steve mentioned, I launched the uh, program for pluralism and civil exchange at the Mercator Center at George Mason University a few years ago, actually 2020, uh, at the height of COVID, the pandemic. Uh, and it seemed as though there was so much division and conflict and polarization in the country. Now we, as a university-based center, were thinking about ideas and as a place where we foster knowledge and insights, if the marketplace of ideas is oriented towards conflict and discord, it's gonna be very difficult for us to learn anything about each other, learn anything about the world. So we sought to figure out how can we reorient the marketplace of ideas towards, you know, curiosity, towards civility, peace, and conversation. So that's what led to the launch of the program on pluralism and civil exchange. And as we were working on that, um, we got connected to a filmmaker who was curious about these things. Now we always talk about you know, division and polarization, and those of us who are in the beltway, so to speak, uh, in the Washington DC area, we see politicians divided in academia, we see, you know, sort of some elites divided and so on, but we were really curious about other parts of the country. So the film was really a journey to sort of test this out, to see what average Americans truly feel about what's going on. Can they truly have conversations on difficult topics? And so that's what led to this, and we travel across the country to different cities, uh, different states, 
to explore this question with average Americans. So I'd love to get your take after the film and uh, have some conversations with you afterwards. Looking forward to it. Hi. I don't know if you, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, hi, that was a wonderful film. I do very Thank similar you. work myself, so I really appreciate that. Excellent, thank you for um, your work. I know that in the film, we only got to see parts of these conversations. That's right. So what does it look like, especially because you encourage us to go out and have these conversations ourselves, mm -hmm. what does it look like to de-escalate mm -hmm. the situation when it does get heated because every conversation like this is not gonna go as smoothly as what we saw in the film? That's absolutely right. The, what we saw was that people came in with a little bit of trepidation sort of what might happen, what might transpire, uh, because they just did not know the different kinds of energies in the, in the room. Um, but, you know, there were parts where people got really emotional, but I think that you give them space to express, because I think at the end of the day, people want to be heard. Um, in your sort of everyday engagements and interactions, there will be times when, you know, you might say something or a situation might happen and someone might really get passionate about something. I think it's advisable to not try to match their energy and give a little bit of time until they sort of express and bring the temperature down and then continue the engagement. So I think there is a certain flow to these types of conversations that you kind of learn um, and just by practice, you, uh, you get better at it and try to understand you know, where things might go, the trajectory of each engagement. Uh, but it just really uh, comes with time. And sometimes it's not everything that you can, you can de-escalate. And sometimes you just have to walk away and call the whole conversation done at a certain point. And you just have to be judicious about that. But I think at the end of the day, uh, people want to feel scene. And there's a really wonderful book that I often recommend. It's called I Never Thought of It That Way by Monica Guzman. She uh, works for Braver Angels. Um, you know, when the 2016 election happened, her county where she lives, it's Seattle. And, you know, 73% of the country voted for Hillary Clinton. And she didn't understand. She's a very strong progressive. Uh, and as an immigrant herself, her parents are Mexican immigrants um, who are very hardcore Trump supporters. And just trying to reconcile that took her on a journey where she takes a busload of her friends in Seattle and go to a different part of the country where 73% uh, of those people voted for Donald Trump. And it was a small town in Oregon. And they spent an entire day there and it was phenomenal. But one key takeaway from that uh, engagement was that there was an older gentleman who after the discussion said, for the very first time I feel heard and I feel seen. And I think that it, it, that really resonates with me because I think that when I experience a lot of these things, it's always about that, someone feeling as though something has not been heard or seen. So I think when we're able to get there, uh, things eventually uh, de-escalate, but not every situation works out that way. Thank you for that question. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so this may be more of an elaboration on mm -hmm. that question, mm -hmm. um, but I was just wondering, so a lot of these divisive issues mm -hmm. um, affect people on a much wider scale versus some of them affect people uh, more personally. Mm -hmm. So you can have people arguing about like the economy, for example, versus mm -hmm. arguing about like marriage rights or like mm -hmm. gay and trans kids. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering, do you have any ideas on maybe how to approach a situation in which um, the person you're talking to um, like very assertively disagrees with something that you believe is important to your life, like your personal life? Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of these issues, one of the things that creates so much um, just like hate and polarization mm -hmm. is um, 
how deeply personal they can be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to put that aside um, mm -hmm. just in favor of a constructive debate. Sure. Um, obviously, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to this. Uh, oftentimes, when we do our pluralist lab discussions, we start by outlining three important principles. The first is respect. The idea is that we are one another's dignified equals. And so if we are going to share space with each other, we're going to make sure that we accord each other with equal dignity and respect each other to the utmost. So if you agree with that principle, we move to principle two, which is authenticity. And we're not masking our views. We're not pretending to be something we're not. But because we respect each other, we're going to be as honest as possible in this conversation. If we agree on principle two, we move on to principle three, which is curiosity. Because we are in a learning environment and you know, knowledge is built out of asking questions, we have to engage each other with questions. And so if we agree on these three principles, then we can engage. But as you notice there, it's a lot of reflective listening. You know, we call it triadic illumination, but we're basically um, getting into the other person's shoes a little bit briefly, as much as you can, right? Why, you know, why might you be a dog person or a cat person? You know, what are the things uh, from your background that you know, made you so passionate about dogs or cats, right? And so once you try to put yourself in the other person's shoes, and oftentimes when you're doing that, you're being charitable, you're being generous, you're giving grace, um, it often fosters a certain kind of comedy that is really interesting, an interesting dynamic that we observe every single time. Um, and I, I think that allows you to move from sort of the personal to the general, general to the personal from time to time. Um, again, it's not a panacea for everything, but these are techniques that, you know, over time, you realize that when you apply them over and over again, they do help to uh, foster civil discourse. Thanks for the question. Hey, uh, thanks Hi. for coming out and uh, bringing the film out here. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so I took from the film that it's not about changing minds, but more like engagement. Mm -hmm. um, given that like the people who are in the film, the people in this room, we're all already willing to engage. Mm -hmm. What about the people like the the people that need the film, or the people who are not ready to engage? Mm -hmm. So how do we like penetrate into those entrenched people? Yeah, great question, and I get that often. Um, let me address the people in the room first, uh, because I think you know, people often say, oh, we're all open and we don't need this, but everybody else needs it, or all the extreme needs it. I think what's happening is that over time, you know, people are self-censoring because they're worried of what others might think or say. Even the majority of people who can have these types of conversations. Um, and so, you know, what happens is that because of what we see on our screens, um, we get the sense that everyone is so extreme, and so we, we stay quiet. And once we stay quiet, the, the extreme voices become louder and louder. And a lot of this engagement forces or nudges uh, all of us who are you know, the majority to speak up a little bit more, right? And we speak a bit more, we assure each other that, wait a second, most of us you know, think this way, um, so we shouldn't be, be afraid to, to engage. Um, with the extremes, there, there are different programs, uh, different things that work. I'm a big fan of uh, Daryl Davis. He's a jazz musician, African American, who uh, has done some amazing work in his closet. There are lots of uh, KKK robes that he has collected over the years because he's willing to go into certain territories to have conversations with some people who are some of the most extreme people, right? And his program and his approach works for those groups. Um, so you need different tools for different uh, scenarios. And obviously, again, it's not everyone you're going to be able to uh, convince or you know, uh, help in this situation. But I think that when, as, as we, the more we believe and the more we think that a uh, majority of us want opportunities to uh, coexist peacefully and engage constructively across differences, I think the better, because what's happening with polarization is that we are um, you know, overestimating how extreme the other side is. And the more we realize and engage with each other, realizing that, wait a second, we, we, we have different views. Um, I'm not swapping mine for yours, you're not swapping yours for mine, but we begin to see each other differently. We begin to see the issues a little bit differently as well. Thank you. I hope that helps, thank you. Hello. Hi. So, 
our country's kind of been heading toward this mm -hmm. direction for a while. So I was curious, was there a specific instance or overall event that inspired you to make this and feel it needed to be said? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, my, you know, background was, you know, shown a little bit in the film. Uh, you know, growing up, you know, I'd grown up in a, in a military rule, I think for the most part of my, gosh, you know, until I was maybe 15 or 16, uh, it had only been one president who was a military ruler. And, you know, nearly put my dad in jail um, and, you know, threatened us a lot, uh, took two thirds of our assets. And so the objective at home was to stay silent so that we don't get into trouble. Um, and it wasn't until I came to the United States that I realized that there was something so powerful as free speech. And oftentimes when I speak to college students, I want to remind them of how amazing this, um, these values are, these principles are, all these things that are entrenched in the, in, the, in the First Amendment are so amazing that we all have to work really, really hard to sustain these principles and these ideas. And so when we started to look at the types of divisions that we were seeing, you know, seeing uh, sort of self-censoring across uh, college campuses. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing some people saying that the First Amendment goes too far. It's, you know, we should, we should uh, constrain it and so on. We started getting a little bit worried about maybe we are taking these things for granted. And uh, liberalism uh, is the kind of thing that you, you take for granted until it's gone. Um, and so that was sort of a turning moment for, for me, especially in 2020 when we were looking at a lot of these issues that were emerging, you know, during COVID, during lots and lots of protests and, um, and so on. And, and for me, I, I, it was almost like a, a life's calling to, to be involved in this work. So thanks for that. Yes, sir. Good, <clears throat> Good evening. Good Thank evening. you for the experience today. I appreciate that. Sure. And from my understanding from the movie, uh, you urge for a local social solution to these social political issues such as uh, gridlock and partisanship. But in a different way, do you see that there's any space for a political solution towards these social political issues? That's a great question. Yes, um, at the political level, there's a lot that is wrong as you might you know, uh, envision. Um, I think that the political dynamics are such that politicians are catering to the most polarized. And what happens is that most of us do not even vote in the primaries, right? And so only about 20% of Americans are actually engaged in the primary system. And some of the 20% are the most engaged, passionate, and sometimes the most polarized. And so they pick the options that um, eventually we all don't want, <laughs> right? but we are stuck with these options. And I think that it's important for us to be engaged in that process as well. Uh, because then you have people who are, you know, politicians who then are extremely polarized, more so than the average American is. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There are scholars that are smarter than, than, than myself who have talked about things like ranked choice voting, uh, not at the federal level, but at least at the local level, to serve up some of these sort of um, less polarized candidates uh, to engage in these conversations. There are you know, discussions around whether having 435 representatives is enough, right? Because we have a much larger population um, who need maybe more representation than we have. I think there are some important conversations to have around those sort of political dynamics and processes. Thank you. Sure. I have another question. Yes. Um, speaking directly about the film itself, mm -hmm. um, the people that we got to meet more detailed in the film were very dynamic. Yes. Um, Great I don't way to remember. put it. I like that. Yeah, yeah they were very dynamic. Mm -hmm. I don't remember meeting anyone who seemed super traditional and came from a traditional household and background and all the things. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you vetted mm -hmm. who you chose to be in this experiment? Yeah, so Dee Alsop, who is the co-founder of the uh, organization called Heart and Mind Strategies, uh, he 
it's a, it's a market research firm, so they helped us to sort of recruit people. And we said we wanted people who are diverse, you know, their backgrounds, their views, you know, where they're located, uh, and that they have strong views as well. So we were looking for those dynamics. But I think they were fairly traditional. Some of them were not as vocal, at least in, in what was shown here. But the way that the process works is that everyone has to express. That's why we keep this in small groups, so that everyone uh, engages and, and talks about their views or why they think this, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there were certainly a few, you know, maybe traditional people. But I actually think that most of us are dynamic. Right? Our views are nuanced, a lot more nuanced than we might think. So we start with the, are you a cat person or a dog person? And then lots of people are like, oh, actually, I have both cats and dogs. <laughs> it's like, oh, really? OK, tell me more. Um, and you know, it's, it's fascinating uh, when you, you know, the, the abortion issue was very passionate and, and you know, it's controversial. But there were people who um, you know, had experienced this, right? And they said, well, no, we, but we still don't think it, it should happen at all, and there should be rules that are restrictive. And people who hadn't, and they said, no, we should have more open. It, just so many cross-cutting perspectives throughout the, the discussions. And I, I think it's so fascinating. And the more you talk to you know, regular Americans in ways that are not like, oh, hey, defend your position, defend that position you realize that, wait a second, there, there's so many nuances that, that we share together. And I think that um, we should explore that more with each other. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. I was just wondering, so at the beginning of the film, you, uh, when you were in that video meeting, you said you were scared. And I was wondering, yes. uh, what, Terrified. what exactly were you scared of specifically? The unknown. Um, oh. What do you mean by that, you know? <laughs> like what part? I think oftentimes when we hear polarization, right, we get the sense that people are going to get um, very uh, agitated and maybe potentially a fist fight, right? Yeah, right. You know, and um, even though I had seen some of the research that indicated that most Americans are not polarized, still, I, I just did not know what we might experience in real time. So I was just expressing just the, the unknown, basically. I got you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. OK, well, let's thank, thank Ben for coming. Thank you for having me. We really appreciate it. <laughs>